So good evening, everyone. Welcome to Delray Beach Public Library. I am Isabella Rowan, the program coordinator. Please be advised that this program is being recorded. So I request that you stay mindful and remain muted until the end of the program. So if you could please re mute your, your, uh, your microphones, that would be great for right now until the end. Thank you. Uh, today's program is made possible by the American Rescue Plan Humanities Grants for Libraries, an initiative of the American Library Association made possible with funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities through the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. In the chat box, you will see a link to a survey about tonight's program. Please provide your feedback at the end. The survey is short, it takes like two minutes, and your answers are anonymous, but this will help me plan future programs, and I really appreciate it if you could, if you could fill it out. So tonight's event is a kickoff to our Women in Translation Month programs. This August marks the ninth year since Women in Translation Month was founded. The aim is to promote women writers from around the world, writing in languages other than English and to raise awareness of the disparities that exist in publishing books and translation that are written by women. Only 30%, 30, 30% 30 of new releases of fiction and poetry published in English translation each year are written by women. Male writers still have the lion's share. This affects how women writers in translation are reviewed, promoted, recognized by award committees and discovered by readers. And so while tonight's guest is not a woman, he is a translator and a publisher of books in translation, some by women writers. Plus he is an indie publisher and he's been doing it for a really long time. So I'm excited to pick his brain about the world of publishing in general, the art of translation, and we'll even ask him for advice about how to get published, whether in translation or not. So. Keep in mind, before we officially get started with Russell, that in the next couple of weeks, we have more unique programs to explore language and translation and new writers. And I hope that you will join us for all the upcoming cool events. So tonight's speaker, tonight's special guest is Russell Scott Valentino. His essays, translations, and scholarship have appeared in a wide range of US and international literary magazines, scholarly journals, and trade and university presses. He is currently professor and chair of Slavic and East European languages and cultures at Indiana University Bloomington. He served as editor in chief at the Iowa Review from 20, 2009 to 2013, president of the American Literary Translators Association from 2013 to 2016, Chair of the Editorial Board at Slavica Publishers from 2013 to the present, and Founder and Senior Editor at Autumn Hill Books since 2005. His most recent book, a translation of Mielianko Yurgovich's 900 page, 900 pages, Family Saga Kin, was published in 2021 by Archipelago Books. In 2022, he is serving on the jury in the translated literary category for the National Book Awards. Welcome, Russell Valentino. Thank you. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. Thank you so much. And I apologize to all of you for the technical difficulties in getting us started on time, but here we are now and thank you for being here. So we're going to have a conversation. Yes. And let's start off with the first question. Um, actually more of a comment, I guess. Tell us a little bit of the history about Autumn Hill Books came to be. So Autumn Hill, uh, first of all, I should say that's a translation of my wife's last name. Uh, so we, we, we founded, a, I founded the press based on uh, a translation press that would, that would focus primarily on translations based on uh, a translation. And uh, her last name is Akiyama. Uh, which is uh, Japanese for fall mountain or autumn hill. And so we uh, we started in, 20, in 2005 when I was still at the University of Iowa. So it was a, a sort of an Iowa City um, 
phenomenon. I don't know if those of you who know Iowa City know that it's a highly literary place. There, uh, the the joke at the time when I was living there, and I think it's still the joke that they use. If you if you toss a, a stone out your window of your car, you'll either hit a doctor or a writer, uh, because there's a big there's a big hospital and there are a bunch of writers or someone who's training to be a writer. And um, and so it was it was a very uh, I would say very literary atmosphere, but also in a in a sense heady literature. I mean, there were all sorts of plans, and I my um, affiliation was probably closest to I was both in the trans, literary translation program. There's an MFA in literary translation there, and then the international writers uh, international writing program IWP, which is run by Christopher Merrill, and um, that is a it's a really exciting program they bring about covid notwithstanding uh they bring about between 30 and 40 writers to iowa city every fall for a three-month residency which basically just transforms the town you know they do readings at the public library they do readings at prairie light books they they sit in on people's classes and they all are on, in a regular translation workshop with local writers translating their own work into English. Um, and so it's a it's a fantastic atmosphere. The MFA in, in uh, literary translation is one of, I believe, five writing MFAs. There's one in playwriting, uh, one in poetry, obviously, in the writer's workshop, one in fiction writer's workshop, and then a really good nonfiction MFA. And the the, the students really interact a lot. And at the time, uh, I believe our students in the MFA in translation were especially attracted. I don't know why this was, but they were really working closely with the MFA in nonfiction students. And they were doing a lot of joint readings together. And I knew the director of that program, Robin Hemley, and we organized a couple of um, uh, study abroad trips where we took writers with us and went to other places in the summer. Uh, and uh, it was in that atmosphere, right? I was looking around thinking, what's missing here? Well, <laughs> there was such a such a small number of translations being actually published, book translations, that I thought, well, it's a press. I think it's a press that's missing. Um, and so, yeah, so in 2004, uh, about that, I, I started working on it. And established it as a Iowa nonprofit initially. And uh, since then we moved to Indiana, but it's still an Iowa nonprofit corporation that just has permission to do business in Indiana. So, yeah. Wow, that's that's cool. That's like, yeah. you know, following your dream in a way. You know, you get the idea and you just pursue it and, you know, here you are. That's great. So can you tell us what are some of the biggest risks you've taken as a business and how did you navigate them? Biggest risks. So, um, you know, uh, I don't think we ever took any huge risks. I mean, I didn't take out loans to do this. Uh, basically, it was a labor of love. Uh, and when uh, whenever anybody uh, came to us and said, "Well, you know, I'd like I'd like for you to look at our manuscript," I would say, "You you do know we're we're tiny, right? We're a micro press. We do very small numbers of books, and we don't." really have the the personnel to to market them extensively we're not going to we're not going to have a marketing campaign we'll work with you on getting a writer here if you want to try and bring the writer if we can get money from a foreign government let's say a, a um, an arts program the NEA might have the local uh, the local branch of the NEA the Iowa Arts Council or or in in Indiana it's the Indiana Arts Council and um or with uh, the public library, we'll set up readings, all of that stuff. But it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to involve you. You, translator, uh, <laughs> are going to have to be involved with this. Most people were still on board. Most people liked that idea and said, yeah, that's exciting. I'll help. I'll help wherever I can. It, it did mean that uh, we would only ever do small numbers. Um, and I think we maxed out at about three titles in, in a year. But that's about as, as many as we could do, just with the personnel that we had. I, you know, maybe one year we did four, even five. We have an imprint that is run through the, uh, the uh, International Writing Program. And that has 
so they basically are the curators of the project. And our, our primary collaborator there is the assistant associate director of the uh, uh, International Writing Program. Her name is Natasha Jurovica, Jurovicova. And she will be the, so she'll curate a book for us. Often it's an alum of the, I, the IWP. And some of those are written in English as opposed to translated into, into English. And that's a little bit unusual for us. Um, they've also done a few anthologies, um, also a little bit unusual for us. But that means that when there are other people doing something like that, we publish an additional book. Right. Sure, sure. And that, that raises the number in a particular year. If it's just up to us, it's just up to me, everybody's freelance. We have a freelance designer, we have a, our distributors in Chicago, um, and we will work with the translator, and then I do all the copy editing. If it's just that, it's probably two titles a year, maybe three at the most. Um, so it's a small number. And risk-wise, the risk is overextending ourselves. Sure. Uh, if if we say yes to too much, and then people start to get a little upset because it's too, it takes too long. It takes too long. Um, that's a kind of a rule of publishing. I've noticed people <laughs> that, that the publishers take a long time. They take a long time. Sometimes it's an it's it's silence for years. <laughs> <laughs> and then you hear from them and they say, oh, you know, that thing you sent me three years ago, is that still available? And uh, so we're not the only ones who have trouble with this. Uh, even large, even larger operations do have uh, uh, backlogs. Yeah. Sure. So you, um, you primarily publish works in translation and you've kind of talked a little bit about why that is. Um, but you also said that you do some works in English. So can you just like maybe expound a little bit more on why translation, which would also go into the question about why is why are books in translation even important? Like are people mm -hmm. still reading them? You yeah. Know? Yeah. So uh, uh, so the only books we publish that are written in English are those that are curated by the International Writing Program in that series, that imprint, it's called 91st Meridian Books. Okay. And everything else we do is, is, is literature to translation. And that's because that's my expertise. Um, as a literary translator, as somebody who taught literary translation, as somebody who studied literary translation, written about literary translation, that's what I feel most comfortable and most competent to curate myself. Um, and so now I've edited a ton of books that are translated also from languages that I don't know, um, which becomes a skill uh, as well. Um, and then overseen a whole bunch of uh, theses, MFA theses by translators, budding translators, emerging translators um, from, from languages, a, a whole bunch of different languages uh, in, a, in all sorts of different genres. And then taught in, in that MFA program primarily, uh, in a workshop environment, which is the way they teach literary fiction and poetry as well, and nonfiction for that matter. So that's that's the reason why translation. Why do I, why do we publish translation? The 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 other reason there is that is that uh, perception of a gap, perception of a of an absence, which was born from a particular moment in the early two thousands when. It just looked like it, the publishing scene was ex especially vibrant in the United States, but especially uh, dull when it came to translation. If you looked at the uh, in those years, if you looked at the the large large publishing houses, they they only published a few. They really didn't do a lot of translations, and there weren't that many independent presses mm -hmm. at that moment that were doing translations. The situation has changed since then. We were one of the ones that came on. We we came into business and we started in probably two thousand five. But then after that, you had um, you had open letter books and um, Dalkey Archive was already existing, and so they they were probably the only other person, the only other company. And then Archipelago came on board, and then um, what's the one in Texas? Um, uh, it's Will Evans. I forget him, forgetting his last name, but his his press right now. 
But um, that's another one. There were two, there's two lines press out of San Francisco that came on board after that. So there were quite a few that started up uh, after 2005. And I think it was a kind of a, a perception that was common among a number of people who were talking with each other also, uh, that, that this was a need, that there was a, that there was a, there was a, a real um, uh, absence in the, in the US publishing scene that needed sure. to be addressed. And uh, I think we've kind of done that. It's still it's still hit or miss. There's still you know a lot of books that are just not not finding an audience here, uh, just because it's a really big market. But it's uh, hit or miss in terms of uh, you know whether you find the right publisher for the right project. And that's that's just publishing. I think publishing is one of the one of the it's an, it's not an industry like filmmaking and we right. don't do good market. we did very we do very poor market research or none we do no no market research if you get a really a, a book that is a hit it's like oh look people like this it's like an accident uh and it, I, i'm always surprised i shouldn't be anymore but i'm always surprised at how that happens um yeah, so the, I hope I've addressed at least at least a couple of things. So that's the why that the the two two aspects of the why were my expertise, perceived need, and then the only other books we we publish that are that are not uh, translations are are curated by somebody else. So do you have advice or ideas like if if someone has published a book or has written a, a manuscript in English? And they want to tra have it translated and published in a different language. I mean, how do you have an idea of how they would go about doing that? And well, then so, part of that yeah. question, too, is also like, so you said that when you're publishing, the works are already curated. So you don't accept like blind submissions or people can't just do people ever mail you a manuscript? Like, you know, like, what do you look for? And what would someone want to do if they want to? translate from English into a different language. Okay, so uh, I should I should backtrack. So the only ones that are already curated are those that are coming through the International Writing Program for that particular imprint, 91st Meridian Books. Got it. Everything okay. else everything else we published is is our books that we somehow come to see. And there are various ways that that can happen. Somebody can email me and say Hey, I've got something. It looks like the other things you you've published. Uh, would you like to take a look? And here's here's the basic thing. I mean, that's just a very 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 um, informal uh, email query. And okay. I might say, yeah, send it to me, and I'll have a look. Which <laughs> that doesn't happen very often, but sometimes. And uh, Another way that it happens, so we we haven't done this in a while, but for a number of years, the, our managing editor who, um, was um, Sarah Vereen, and she was really good at um, using uh, the online uh, submission software that's out there, Submittable and, and other ones. And she would open us up for a month uh, in the spring and a month, month in the fall, a little bit like a literary magazine does. Uh, for uh, works to, just to come in over the transom, and and people and we got a number of books that way. Uh, another way that we get books is through people we have already translated. They come and say, or or translators who already worked with us, they come and say, well, this is something I'm working on now. Uh, I published a number of former the work of some former students uh, because I knew what they were working on. And so uh, I'm giving you all the wide variety. Oh, uh, um, another way that we published a book, probably our best best selling book so far, was through something called the Literary Publishing Project, the Japanese Literary Publishing Project (JLPP), which was, and it's a little bit similar to the way the Koreans do it. They they commission a number they, this doesn't exist anymore but at that time that this commit this, they commissioned a number of works that they thought ought to be translated into english they had them translated they acquired the rights they had them translated they paid the translators they put them in a catalog they sent them to u.s publishers and said here are some books <laughs> have a look uh and we saw one we really liked uh, it was it's a classic uh, Japanese uh, story 
uh, that's it's a collection of stories and this this particular story is called Sangetsuki. We published it uh, in probably 2010, 2011. Uh, translate it's by Atsushi uh, Nakajima Atsushi and it's called The Moon Over the Mountain and it's a collection of stories based on ancient Chinese stories so Japanese stories from the 1940s based on ancient China and that is a genre in Japan people write these kinds of stories apparently and this one is very well known Sangetsuki it's about a man who turns into a tiger uh, and um and so we, it was a fun book to do, I have to say. But that one came in in a completely different way. It was, it was right. not a submission. It was just uh, something we saw in a catalog and said, yeah, we should do that. So for the people who are in, have published in English or are writing in English, mm -hmm. don't want to go the other way. Yep. Um, do you know of other publishers who do that? Is it one of those things where they're, they're writing to you know, Italian publishers or, you know, French publishers like directly or like, do you have some advice for that? So I don't think that generally works. <laughs> uh, usually the way that it's, it's, it's somewhat similar to the way U.S. publishing works. So if, if the book is published in English, the other publishers get uh, regular lists of what has been published. And there are agencies, usually it depends on the publisher, but there are agencies that consolidate. And so they they look, they will submit like a catalog and say, here are the works that have been have been published this year in whatever domain it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then those publishers that are publishing US literature translated into US-based literature translated into, I don't know, Italian or French or whatever, they look at those. I it's a little, like a library, like like a library catalog, right? Which right. are the acquisitions you want to buy? They look at those and say, "Oh, this this could sell," and then they decide whether or not they want to have it translated. Huh. Um, but it, it's it's not usually based. It's not usually dependent on the U.S. publisher. I see. It's the, or on the writer necessarily. No, I mean it, obviously. Right? Yeah, obviously, star writers are in a different category all, all, completely. But yeah, mostly writers who are not, they're, you know, they're not known in another country. It depends on on the publisher, uh, the foreign publisher. Right, right. That's interesting. Um, so you mentioned the Japanese book that was based on ancient Chinese stories that you translated into English. Right. Yeah. Are there I didn't any? Translate it. <laughs> right. But I didn't translate it. right. It's Paul, Paul McCarthy. His name is Paul McCarthy and Nobuko Ochner. Those are the two translators of that volume. Very. And you uh, published it. Okay. And we published it. Yes. So besides that one, um, is there any other titles or books that were really like stood out, were impactful for you, that were like game changers, you know, or something for? Um, I would say. Uh, the uh, a book called Foreign Words has uh, st seems to linger. Um, it is by a Greek author who write, his name is Vasilis Alexakis, and he writes um, he writes in French. <laughs> so he's Greek. He he left during the military junta, and he he moved to Paris and. He, I think he became more of a writer when after he moved there. And so he, he basically, he, he, he publishes every one of his books twice, first in French, and then he self translates into Greek and the book comes out again in Greece. And the Greeks consider him a Greek writer and the French consider him a Francophone writer. He's not French, obviously, but he's a Francophone writer. So he's up for the prizes in both countries and, um, and uh, Alison Waters brought us that book. She had had, she had got, this happens so many times. Uh, she had an NEA uh, to publish, to translate the book. Uh, and then she couldn't find a publisher. And it was a great book. Uh, and uh, that's not the first time I, I'm telling you that this happens often. People get an NEA, they translate a really good book, then they, and they do it and they finish the work. And in a sense, they already got paid for it because they got the NEA, but they're still looking for a publisher. Otherwise, it just sits in their drawer. 
And um, Allison brought it to me and I said, you know, I gave her the, me the usual message, you know, we're tiny. And, but she said, well, yeah, but I can't find it. I've looked and looked and I can't find anybody else to do it. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll read it. And I read it and I thought, this is fantastic. This is a great book. Uh, it reminded me at the time, it reminded me of Life of Pi a little bit. It had a kind of a similar sort of, similar sort of uh, quirkiness about it. Maybe not quite so serious. Uh, Life of Pi is pretty serious, uh, but uh, this is about, it's, it's semi-autobiographical. It's about a, an author who's having trouble writing his book. He thinks, I think I'll learn a new language, right? He's, he's trying to make, make his, break his writer's block. And he doesn't want to learn a regular language. He wants to learn something that's unusual, something he's, he, people don't usually study. So he thinks, how about Africa? I like Africa. How about an African language? And so he 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 settles on Sango, which is a, 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 one of the languages of the Central African Republic. And he starts learning Sango and he looks for people who know Sango and he looks for dictionaries. And the very first words of the book are telling you uh, the, how to say my father in Sango. A and the reason he's doing this is that his father has just passed away and that's part of his writer's block. He's trying to come to terms with the fact that his father just died. Mm -hmm. And by the end, and so you're learning Sango as he's learning Sango in this book. And by the end of the book, the last, I'd say, 15 lines of the book are all in Sango. And if you've been paying attention, you can read them. Oh, how cool is that? It's a very, it's a very cool book. <laughs> I can see why you picked that one. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, wow. That's a cool story. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So it's I, called Foreign Words. Foreign Words, yeah. Uh, and it was translated from the French version. Uh, <laughs> Alison, Alison Waters is a, is a really good uh, French translator. She's a great translator from the French. That's great. Thank you for sharing that story. I'm going to have to yeah. go to Autumn Hill Books website and see if I can buy it. Uh, is it available on your website? Uh, oh, um, you know, we don't usually sell books from our website, but you can sell them. You can get them at a local like bookstore. Yeah, order. it's on Amazon. It's on Powell's. It's on, you know, any of those online vendors. You you can also order it from if you have a local bookstore you want to use, they'll they'll get it from there. Indie bound. You can usually get it from there. Uh, so we try to make it available. I think it's even at Walmart. I mean, we try to make it available. <laughs> well, there's so many online outlets now. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I'll add one more. I think, I think Becca McKay's book was also really, uh, 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 transformative for us. It was probably the, it might've been the third or fourth book that we published. I'm actually glad um, you're bringing that up. I was going to ask about that one. Cause you know, she's coming yeah. to lead a book discussion about the book laundry, which yeah. if you didn't hear my announcement, the first time we tried to log in, if you register for the book discussion, which is on the 18th at one o'clock, you can get a copy of the book for free. It's we're, We have some giveaway copies so you can read it. And I am personally reading it. So I would love to hear, you know, your take on the whole process. Yeah. So that, book. that book, I mean, that's a, it's such a feverish book. It's a very, I don't know if you're, I don't know if you're experiencing right now, but it's, it's, it's got this kind of feverish quality that it kind of pushes you all the way through and you don't quite yes. know what it's like something's about to happen and it's it, it feels unpleasant something unpleasant and uh and it keeps you going and i think that she she struggled a little bit my editing amounted to reading her reading her version and say and and trying to make it feel a little less feverish because I think she was feverish also. Translating it, it started to overtake her. And it, you know, it wasn't very much. It was like even some paragraphs because it, it tended to be all one paragraph. I don't right. think it was all one paragraph, but it tends to feel like it's just, it's just rushing forward. And so I think I, I suggested breaking it up in a few places, making it feel like, okay, there's a new thought here. So why don't we, why don't we move on to a new paragraph? This is a few places, things like that. Um, she was working together with the author, Suzanne Adam. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, she was checking things and making sure that uh, she understood all of the references. Uh, and the book takes place in, in two, two places. It's partly, it's partly in, um, Transylvania in, in, I'm trying to remember if it was then 
Hungary or Romania. I'm, I can't remember. I think it's Hungary. And then, and then partly in Israel. And uh, after she, after the, the main character moves there. And, uh, but, you know, she's kind of haunted by the past. And it right. is about children and it's about caretaking. Yes. And, and, uh, and mm, abuse in some uh, trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, it's uh, it's quite effective, um, and but a very different book from Foreign Words. Foreign Words is much more, I don't know, it's, it's French and <laughs> it's French and it doesn't speed forward in that way. It's much more, uh, uh, it's lighter, I would say, and and kind of reflective. Right. Uh, charming right. is charming. That's the word. It's charming. Yes. Uh, yeah. Whereas, laundry is is pretty. Oh, it is pretty feverish and when and I I've not finished it I've read through maybe the first five chapters or so but I am hooked so if you want yeah. a copy come on into the library and get one because it's uh but I'm still trying to figure out what happened like what you know it opens up where there's been some kind of uh, something but you don't know what it is um and I still have yet to learn what it is so I'm I am reading it to see. I'm not going to spoil anything. No, don't, spoil, do, don't spoil it. I won't spoil anything. But I do really <laughs> love also, the, another thing I really love about that book is the is the is is where the title comes from. Uh, I don't know if you've got to that part I got yet. to that part. Yeah, it's just. Yes. Yeah. It's not laundry in the traditional sense. So <laughs> if I yeah. have not hooked you with that, you need to come into the library and get the book. <laughs> and I'm super excited to have this conversation with Becca too who yeah. translated it so here you know her side. we managed we managed to get uh the greeks and the israelis to work together to bring suzanne um uh and to bring uh, vasilis uh both of them came to you to the u.s to do a little a small tour uh -huh. reading and uh when she came she came to iowa city and she really wanted to meet the the book designer because the cover is quite effective and it she, is she it's very like it. It is. Yeah. Oh, that's that's awesome. Um, Justin Justin Angles. He's the design. He's the designer. Okay, that's cool. Um, let's see. How many? This is not on the list of questions we sent you, but how many languages do you know? So my working languages, uh, the ones that I I use in my in my job, pretty often are Russian. Uh, a Bosnian, Croatian, Mont Montenegro, and Serbian, which I consider one, mm -hmm. uh, and um, Italian and French. Okay. Uh, what I've e I've edited a bunch of other languages, and so I feel pretty comfortable editing a translation from from Spanish is so close to 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 French and Italian. I can I can usually spot the problems and and help a little bit. And I feel pretty comfortable editing from uh, other Slavic languages again because of the, the relationship. And then I studied some German, so I, I I've I've edited some from German as well. So those I don't feel that comfortable, but I've done it <laughs> editing translations from Korean and and Japanese. Mm. There I'm really focusing on the English and and where something feels like it might be awkward or or feels like they the translator might have done something a little unusual I, I'm good at asking questions right um, and that's true of other languages that I've that I've edited um, where I haven't really studied those languages Korean was the hardest because I didn't even know the script so you know right <laughs> looking at the script thinking well there are five of these things <laughs> whatever <laughs> whatever the sound is uh, but yeah with Japanese at least I can I can make things out interesting I I envy people who can speak more than one language it's it's a big deal so um all right let's see here you are a translator yourself mm -hmm. right so why don't you tell us a little bit about um your work and how that process is for you as as a translator um well so i studied with uh michael henry heim who is the English translator of The Unbearable Lightness of Being mm -hmm. and The Joke and uh, Death in Venice and a whole bunch of other books. He was a really prolific translator and he translated from 
I don't know. He translated from he has a he has a book of Chekhov plays. So he translated from Russian. He translated from Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian. He translated from German. He translated from uh, Dutch. He translated from Hungarian and Romanian. And at the end of his life, he he died when he was sixty nine. He he it was it was fairly young, but he was he went back to Chinese, which he had studied as an undergraduate, and he was. He was thinking of translating some stuff from Chinese. He one time said, "You know, the it's if the it's worth it's worth learning the, a language in order to translate something really good from it." That was that was what motivated him to to learn a language. It was because he wanted to translate something, and um, so he was quite. And he was a professor at UCLA. That's where I went to graduate school. He was quite inspiring in that sense, and also. Um, sort of a, a, a model, uh, even though I haven't quite done all the same languages as him. Uh, and he was the person I studied uh, with uh, in graduate school, and I had my first translation workshop with him. Um, and so learned a little bit about how you, how you deal with texts. And he was also a fantastic editor. Uh, so he was very, very careful. And he had, I don't know if you've ever, it, seen the old editorial marks that people used to make. Mm -hmm. They don't make them anymore because now everybody uses Word and, and they just turn on the track changes and then you right. see the changes. But they used to do these fantastic calligraphy things with you know circles and, and squiggles and, and insertion marks. And he did that to one of my translations one time and I kept it. And his papers are in the Lilly Library at Indiana University. And I donated that because I thought, you know, this is an art, is his handwriting and the margin with all of that. It really is an art. And um, it's and it's really cool to look at. You know, it's, it looks like a it looks like something you could frame this page. Um so uh yeah, so that that was how I got my start. And um and how I've tried to teach other people as well, you know, not necessarily down to the squiggles but but that attention to detail and uh that sense of responsibility if you're going to translate if you're going to learn some you're going to translate something you have to know the language really well know the way that the grammar works in in completely you know in this sentence you got to be able to say this is an indirect object here right this this right here is an indirect object and this is the date of case you, you need to understand all that when you when you start, when you translate that sentence, because otherwise you're likely to make a mistake, right? right. You're, you're just likely, or, or a bunch of them. Um, that translation that I did that you mentioned, uh, right. Kim Milion Koyegovich's uh, big, big book, uh, it took me two and a half years, two years and eight months, uh, which was about eight months longer than the publisher had given me, but she was okay with it. Jill Schoolman, she's, she's, good about that um and the the editing process was a little bit unusual uh because uh, they they looked at they looked at the uh, i don't know exactly who did it there but it might have been more than one person who was working on it copy editing but um they didn't really show me what they had done <laughs> they sent me back the whole text and it was it was edited, but I didn't see the track changes. It was an, it was a new PDF. So, and, and I think that probably would work okay with a small, with a shorter book, but with a longer book, it, it was a lot of work. I, I had to go back through the whole thing again and just basically read the whole, the whole translation against the original and my, my text to see what they had changed. And, um, and they caught maybe a dozen mistakes that I had made. And I caught then another dozen <laughs> as I was rereading uh, mm -hmm. because it's long. I mean, it's just in inevitable that uh, out of that many pages, I think it went, we also edited it down just a little bit. It was a thousand pages in the, in the original. It came down to about 900. From and Russian, right? This was from Bosnian. Bosnia. Croatia. Okay, great, okay. Yeah. And, uh, and that's because, you know, that happens, uh, I think we have more of a um, professional editing regime in this country and along with the UK than pretty much any other country, uh, especially for big shot writers. Big shot writers get edited just like everybody else here. 
But in other countries, a writer who's very prestigious might not be edited much at all because that person is very prestigious and they don't tend to touch that person's work. So that means if they wrote a lot and maybe repeated themselves a little bit, it doesn't get pointed out to them in the same way that, you know, Norman Mailer would have had that pointed out to him. Toni Morrison had it pointed out to her here. Right. And, and it just doesn't happen as much in other countries. So when they get translated to English, it happens here, right? It happens in that process. You're doing, you're both uh, editing the translation and you're editing the book mm -hmm. at the same time. And uh, that's, that's a phenomenon of U.S. publishing and sure. U.K. publishing as well. So when you, you mentioned that when they would send back the edited versions to you and there were corrections made, what happened? Like, how was the process? And this is true for editing, regardless of whether it's from uh, in translation or not. But what kind of, uh, um, what if you didn't agree with their changes? So uh, again, the, that it, it much it depends a lot on the press, but I think most editors uh, are uh, willing to work with you when you disagree with something that they they have they have suggested. If they wanted to change something, and that that was true in this case too. I just said, you know, I think I think he likes run on sentences. <laughs> I think he likes I think he likes a comma splice. And we don't use comma splices so much in English. And it bothers me that you're putting all his comma splices back. I think we, what I did was slightly edit just a little bit to make it an actual English sentence mm -hmm. that does, is not gonna bother most people. And can we put those back? And Jill just said, oh yeah, fine, <laughs> sure. It just depends on the, on the editor in that case. The, and you know, the way I edit is I show, it, I show the translator everything I've done. Um, okay. Now that's what I sort of expected to happen in this case. It didn't, and I don't know exactly. I think the person they were having look at the translation maybe didn't do uh, the software very well, and so they ended up with a PDF. Um, so, but what I what I do is I, I give a, a as a general note at the beginning. Here is the strategy I've been following. Here are the things that I've I I want you to pay attention to because I. I looked at this, this, and this in particular, and I was hoping to try to, there were places where the, where the author tended to go off a little bit, and I, and I wanted to make it a little bit more oh, coherent. And then I leave all the track changes in and say, you know, please look at these author. This is what I've done. Author or translator, in this case, translator, I did this. Uh, and so they can see it. And, and then they can, they can tell me if they, if they think I, I shouldn't have changed something. Right. Um, I think that's the way most editors work these days. Mm -hmm. uh, and with translation, it's just it's just trickier because you've, you, as I said, you're kind of doing both things at the same time. You're editing the translation, and you can be editing the book. Uh, some people can be really. Uh, I've noticed some editors feel very comfortable cutting quite a bit <laughs> from the from the original book. Um, I'm not as comfortable with that. I, I feel like, you know, most of the time you have to be, well, I think all the time you have to be very careful with that. And most of the time there's a reason why it's there. Uh, so we should probably- oh, boy, it explains why it takes so long. <laughs> I can only yeah. imagine. So one final question. And then if you guys have any questions for Russell that, you know, you're welcome to share them. Um, I just would like to end my part of this with you to ask you why why should people read literature and translation yeah that's a that's a good question there's a there's a book about, uh, uh, Edith Grossman has a book that's called why translation matters mm -hmm. and she answers a number of those questions uh, she's a translator of uh, golden primarily golden age Spanish literature so Don Quixote and and other books like that. Um, there, there. I think for a while, people uh, naively were were they believed that somehow reading translated literature was uh, encouraging, enc encourages you to have 
a, a more uh, cosmopolitan outlook, maybe, or um, that it m maybe changes your morals in a way, some somehow. It, it gets, it's about cross cultural communication. I, I I do feel like that's a little naive. I, reading in general does that reading fiction in general it's 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 it gets you into other people's shoes right it, it gets you out of your perspective and and maybe shakes up your complacency i think one of the things trans, reading translated literature does is encourage maybe one step further just because it often is set in other places often and it doesn't it's not a automatic that translated literature is is going to be set in other, another country. Sometimes it is set in your country. Uh, it's just that it happened to be written in a, in another language. Um, so that that facile, I think, is a little too. It is a little naive and a little too facile to say reading translated literature makes you a better person. Uh, I don't think it makes you any better person than reading literature does. <laughs> I think that's pretty much the same phenomenon, uh, and. What translated literature does is take you a little bit to other places, which can change, which can add to your perspective. And, and that, that sense of complacency, often I think the best translated literature is shaking up your sense of complacency, right? Especially English language complacency, where you think everything is accessible in English mm -hmm. and it, you know, a good translation will often point out in subtle ways how, yeah, this is a different word. This, it, it's not, these, these, this, these, these people speak a different language. It reminds me of that old Steve Martin joke. Those French people, they're so obnoxious. They have a different word for everything, you know? And it, it, yeah, it's kind of like that. And people sometimes they pick up a book thinking it's just, it's just going to come to them. And often translated literature forces you a little bit more to go to go out, go to that other place. And that's, I think, where the major benefit is likely to lie. Great. Thank you so much. Do you guys have any questions for Russell? Any comments, questions? You can unmute yourself. There's just, just this many of us, so you don't have to type it. You can call it out if you'd like. And if you want to do what Russell just said and you know, take reading a little bit further, I have a whole display of all the new books of women <laughs> in translation here at the library. And I highly recommend them. So yeah. come on I'd in. I'd love to see that list. I, I haven't <laughs> looked at your list yet. I'd love, I'd love to see it. I'll um, send it to you because yeah, it's- please do. Yes, I will send it to you. It's fabulous. I'm excited for all the books that we have. Um, so, you know, give these women a shout out. It's like I started this new book club called BYOB, Bring Your Own Book. And uh -huh. you can come and, and uh, whatever you're reading, just come and talk about that. Well, you know, there's not the same book, whatever you want. And at our last meeting, these, these people were talking about how they loved these books they were reading, but everyone said that their book took place in a different country. You know, some were Scandinavia, one was a French detective in Belgium, one, you know, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm like, you guys, pay attention to what you just told me, okay? <laughs> You're reading an English language author telling you stories from foreign countries. What about if you read a book in translation that is a, even a little bit more native, even though you're still going through the translator, you're still, I mean, like how much richer might that be for you? Might yeah. that be, you know? And they're like, oh yeah. So come on. There, <laughs> and there are some really good, there are some really good ones. As I, you mentioned, I'm reading the, I'm reading the, uh, for the National Book Awards this right now. And I've got to read a bunch of books, but uh, some of these books are fantastic. I mean, and they're they're brand new, and many of them. I mean, you have, maybe you haven't seen some of them yet because I'm getting the advanced review copies. Oh, but some of them you. are out. Yeah, well, some of them are out, right. and and uh, and they're just I, I can't tell you which ones because I'm not supposed to talk about it. But Darn. they're really they're really great, <laughs> uh, and um, we're we're. The long list, our long list is due to them in September. So very soon, the, the long list is only 10 books. So the, you'll you'll have a list of 10 there. So really. how many have you had to read 
to whittle it down to 10. Well, I'm still reading. Uh, and there are, there are probably about a, about 160 or so that have come UPS over, over the, since March, 170, 160, 170. And there are five people on the committee. So we had to come up with a way of, you know, getting through all of these. Uh, there's no way that each one of us can read 170 sure. books. Sure. Right. So we're, we're doing a form of a uh, collective triage. <laughs> That's good. That's good. And these are all works that have been translated, right? Yeah. Yeah. To, yeah, yeah so you're in the translated literature category. Right. And they, and it's not poetry. And so it's only uh, fiction and, and literary nonfiction. Okay. Um, I don't know why they don't. In, well, I do sort of know why they don't include poetry in this category. It's a little bit odd because if you think about it, that means for the poets, who are for poetry that's translated that must go that must be judged by the poets in the poetry category for the right. national book awards but the literary translation category includes the fiction and the nonfiction that have been translated uh it's a little bit odd i mean you think about that it yeah. doesn't quite match up uh, right yeah so you start out so you're whittling it down to a long list of 10 and that's by november so then no, when, by, by september september and then is there October, then a short, October is the short list, and then November is the is the announcement of the winner. Oh, okay, that's something to look look forward to. Yeah, uh, I, I think. You know? Yeah, I hope I'm. And I mean, it's a it's a good committee. Uh, Anne Goldstein is the is the chair of the committee, and she is a translator of Elena Ferrante, and those those books have done really really well. And so, yes. um, she, and she's been hurt it's like herding cats because <laughs> there are five of us and we're in different places and so uh but we've uh, we're making our way through and they're really good books that's exciting do you have anything that you're working on now that you're translating any new projects personally uh we uh, so i'm not i'm writing i'm not translating i'm writing a book uh okay. And so um, yeah, I've done that occasionally. I've sort of gone back and forth, either writing or translating. Okay. And uh, I don't know why that is, but I'm writing a book on the um, on the Adriatic. It's called um, Sea of Intimacy. It's after a... So I translated two books by this guy named Predrag Matveyevich. One was called An Eastern Epistolary, and the, the other was called The Other Venice. And my teacher, the guy that I mentioned, he published, he translated another book by that same guy, the Yugoslav author, that uh, was published uh, probably about 1999 called Mediterranean, A Cultural Landscape. And in that book, there is a line, the Mediterranean, the, the Atlantic and the Pacific are seas of distance, the Mediterranean, a sea of propinquity, proximity, and uh, the Adriatic, a sea of intimacy. And so I've been working on the Adriatic for many, many years, uh, both sides, Italian and Croatian, right? So there, there are those, yeah. those two languages that come in. And I spent time in Venice and Trieste and Corfu and, um, and uh, Dalmatia. And so uh, I finally decided, well, I'm going to write this thing. And so I've been writing about that. So that's in, so I'm not translating right now. I'm writing. You're writing. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. That's great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Guys, any questions, comments, anything? Um, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you My so pleasure. much. For it's a pleasure here. talking with you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Read, read widely. That's your challenge. <laughs> thank okay. you so All much. Right. Take, care. Take care. Take care. Bye.